everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Chapter 2 from the Nelson textbook, which covers speech, language, literacy, and communication. So there's quite a few slides in this lecture, so I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. I am going to skip through some of them and try to pinpoint some of the main points through the chapter. So there's five main points. The first one is speech, language, and communication. The second one is the five language parameters. Three, content, form, and use. Four, language levels and modalities. And five, cultural linguistic variation. So on page 54 is the chapter summary and the study questions. And once again, I encourage you to look at those. So here are our chapter learning objectives. So what you should uh, be able to know after studying this chapter. So for the taxonomies, they mentioned three related systems, speech, language, and communication. There's five language parameters, which is phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. The three language domains, content, form, and use. And the two language levels, which is sound and word, or sentence and discourse, interacting with the four communication modalities, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So the purpose of chapter two is to help you develop a flexible internal taxonomy to guide your assessment and intervention practices. So it's important that you have knowledge of various taxonomies, but I want you to know that there is not one correct or one best taxonomy. So this is the um, graphic for the interacting systems. So speech, language, and communication all interact together. So right here on this slide, um, there is a discussion point here. So what I want you to do is look at the following case examples and read over them. So um, for number one, when we look at that discussion point, which is what are some ways speech, language, and communication appear to be relatively more or less involved in the following case examples, for number one, with the child with autism, there's problems in all three domains, but with some relative strengths. When we look at number two, which is the pre-adolescent, we have relative strengths in speech and ex expressive language that may mask difficulties with language comprehension that could be partially responsible for academic difficulties. And for number three, the early elementary school child, we have relative strengths in communication and difficulties with the phonological, morphological, and syntact syn syntactic components of language. And this pattern is typical of speech language impairments. So here we have problems are not just within children um, and neither are the solutions. So that's just something very important to remember. So uh, how does the reminder above, which appears throughout this book, apply to the case examples on the previous slides? And how does the, remain, the reminder to consider areas of strength as well as impairment apply to the case examples on the previous slide? So I wanna encourage you, you should always always consider students' strengths, not just their weaknesses. So this first area for speech that includes reception as well as production. So you should be able to describe the psychological, sensory, and motor systems that um, support speech production. Recognize the role of the central nervous system, also known as the brain and the knowledge of phonology and word and phrase structures in driving the speech production and perception processes. So for speech, we have the physical representation of language, and we also have different modalities or ways we learn speech through speaking, listening, reading, writing, signing, or fingerspelling, and thinking. Here we have the sensor motor contributions. So we have the sensory systems and we wanna also consider those motor systems. Here we have a diagram of the components of a child's speech production system. 
So that's it for speech, and next we're going to talk about language. This includes literate forms in both spoken and written modalities. So language is a socially shared code. It uses a conventional system of arbitrary symbols to represent ideas. It's meaningful to others who know the same code, and it can be described as three systems, form, content, and use. So here we have the definition of language. Language is a complex and dynamic system of conventional systems that's used in various modes for thought and communication. Effective use of language for communication requires a broad understanding of human interaction, including such associated factors as nonverbal cues, motivation, and so social cultural rules. So for literacy, literacy is a language system that is mapped onto spoken language, not a separate system. So it's more than the basic ability to read and write, it's socially and culturally situated view. We have two terms, BIX and CALP. B-I-C-S stands for Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills and CALP stands for Cognitive Academic Language Proficiencies. So there are multiple literacies. We have school literacies, community literacies, and personal literacies. So when we think about communication, we want to understand that this is both verbal and nonverbal. So the traditional communication theory, there's four components, the sender, the receiver, the medium, and the message. So I skipped through a few slides. Here we have tube theory of communication as a form of information transfer. So this is an example of an older model of communication. The co-constructive joint focus theory of interactive circles of communication. So you can see that everything there is circular involving um, a dog. So communication is sharing of needs, experiences, thoughts, needs with another. It's creating joint meanings as dependent on comprehension as expression. And a person may be without speech or language, but unless comatose, everyone communicates. So we have the Grice's maxims here. We have the maxim of quantity, quality, relation, and manner. So violation of these rules can account for many situations in which communication feels odd or uncomfortable. Here we have the speech acts. The speech acts are both developmental stages when they are added one at a time and as components of speech acts at all developmental stages. Okay, I'm going to skip uh, to, whoops, excuse me, this slide on nonverbal communication. So technically what this means is without words. It may accompany communication with words or occur in isolation of linguistic communication. And there's three prominent, prominent mechanisms, so proximate, Kinsic and paralinguistic. So here we have proximate positions to communicate about relationships. So we have intimate, personal, social, consultive, and public. Uh, for Kinsic devices, we have these examples. So adapters, regulators, effective displays, illustrators, and emblems. So the paralinguistic devices is across verbal and nonverbal categories. They use prosody, so they compare the super segment, segmental, excuse me, of speech with the segments. So for example, that's a great looking blue dress. Um, so how are paralinguistic devices signaled? So you want to ask yourself, how are they signaled through emailing and through texting? So that's a discussion point that you can think about. So we have the five systems or parameters of language, which is phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. So you should be able to fluently list the five systems of language and also recognize simple definitions of each. 
Uh, also, in regards to the five systems or parameters of language, they can also be called the rule systems. So here we have a visual. This represents the traditional model of content, use, and form. And overlaid on top of that is the five systems of language. So phon phonology is the sound system of language. So this includes phonemes, a phone, phoneme, allophone, phonetic transcription, and phonatics. So I encourage you to write down the definitions for those uh, found within the textbook. Phonology incorporates phonolo phonological awareness, which is the levels of metalinguistic awareness, phonemic awareness, and phonics. So all three of those are incorporated in phonological awareness. So I'm going to skip through some of these slides and go right to morphology. So this is the system of smallest meaningful units of language. It consists of morphemes and also we have cultural and linguistic influences. So for the inflectional morphemes in English, we look at our verb endings. So we have the present progressive ending in ing, the third person singular, past tense ending in ed, um, participational ending in ed or en. For noun endings, we have possessive and plural. Okay, so once again, I'm going to skip and I'm going to go right to syntax, which is the system for constructing and comprehending, comprehending sentences and intersequential relationships. So syntax is challenging to understand. The purpose of syntax in chapter two is to help you appreciate the phrase and clause structure of sentences, but also to understand that much of syntactic complexity in real life context comes through syntactic cohesion at discourse level. So when we look at syntax, we have the proposition as the basic unit of sentence-like meaning. Uh, we also uh, have the role of the verb as the little dictator, the one or more argument, and it may be called a kernel sentence. So the different types of sentences are declarative, inter interrogative, imperative, and passive. And here are examples of each. So we can embed and combine, we can do that with the phrase structure and the clause structure. So we're looking at the nouns, the verbs, and the prep phrase. Uh, once again, I'm going to skip over to semantics, which is the meaning system of language signs and symbols. You will need to understand how words and sentences refer to ideas by symbolizing things and abstract relationships if they are to be prepared to work with children who are learning to be linguistic symbols to communicate complex meanings. So for semantics, we look at words. So we have meaning versus form, content, categor categorizing, and also semantic features must agree with sentences. So when we look beyond words, we have meanings and sentences, discourse, and context. Here are lexical relationships, the syntonym, the antonym, the hypernym, hyponym, and homonym. We have mechanisms of lexial learning. We have the quick incidental learning, which is fast mapping of word form to meaning. When we look at meaningful differences, there are difference in numbers of words heard by children wearing microphones. Also, we have significant differences associated with SES. So children coming from low SES homes are hearing less words. Uh, we look at this 600 words per day for low-income families. So when we look at pragmatics, we have contextualized variations for supporting the social and communicative uses of language. 
So here are the multiple aspects of the pragmatics of language. Pragmatics of language relates to language use and contextual variation. Okay, so I am going to skip to the language levels by modalities model. This is useful for assessment and intervention with school age students. So when we look at the language levels by modalities model, on the left side for listening and reading, it's a top up process. And for the right side, we have a bottom down process starting with speaking and writing. So the language levels are sound and word and also sentence and discourse. The different modalities are listening, speaking, reading, and writing. When we look at cultural linguistic variation, it's one of the first questions that clinicians must consider in assessment is about the nature of the child's cultural linguistic experience. So with that, no language is uniform and it varies with socio-cultural characteristics, including your background, your location, your social class, gender, and age, and also just your context, whether you're at home, school, or workplace. So also there's social dialects. Everyone speaks a, a different dialect. And then we have bilingualism. So if you speak English in another language or multi, which means if you just speak more than two. And excuse me, bilingualism can mean just you speak two different languages. It does not have to be English. So when we look at the US demographics, we have those here. Um, all of this is reported from the census data self-report. I'm going to skip to the dual language learning. So we have sequential, which is your second, second language learning. This begins after the first language is largely established, which is happens at approximately age three. And then we have the simultaneous, which is the dual language learning. And that's when you're experiencing two or more languages from birth or within the first year. When we look at dialect, the distinction between languages and dialects is usually made more on a social and political grounds than on a purely linguistic one. So for our chapter summary, I know I went through a lot, but we want to keep in mind the classification systems of speech, language, and communication, the five language parameters and systems, content, form, and use, and then also the language levels and modalities. Also, we want to look at cultural linguistic variations. So remember to read over the chapter summary and also to prep for the upcoming exam with the um, chapter questions at the end of the chapter, which I believe was on page 54.